Hi. Mm -hmm. Today, I would like to walk you through my presentation called From Connectivity to Simulation, the Evolution of Digital Twin with Low-Code and No-Code. And uh, yeah, I would like to start with a bit about myself. I'm IoT nerd, as already mentioned by Pavel Fiderek. And I'm a solution architect, uh, IoT solution architect of SoftServe. You can also recognize me from my blog and po podcasts. And uh, you can reach me freely at Twitter, at Ervazeha. Uh, this is the Twitter handle. And on today's talk, I will try to uh, navigate on high level IoT concepts. And it would not be much of the technical talk. So uh, if you are interested in more technical aspects of industry IoT or uh, IoT as a whole, I can recommend uh, the, today's DevOps path of uh, Marcin and yesterday's path of Piotr Kalinowski. So you can go to the, both of those presentations from the DevOps path today and uh, Cloud path today morning and hear a bit more about technical aspects about IoT. I will be focusing more on the strategical perspective since this is the most of the time that I spend on everyday work. And I would like to share with you some of my experiences working on the digital twin and working on the low code and no code platform and how those two actually are combined together. So let me start with a bit of history lesson. So history of digital twin comes back to late 60s and Apollo 11 space mission, actually the whole program Apollo. And uh, during the space race era, uh, this has like a tremendous impact of the way how the things, in this case, space program rockets, are uh, were being developed, uh, how the solutions for lots of out of the world problems have been reached. And the most important part of that uh, it was to have a separation between service module, lunar module, command modules. Uh, all of those uh, modules have been actually created by contractor companies developed all over US. And uh, normally, if you would um, say this is the recipe for a failure. But as we know from history, it was not. Mm, thanks to comprehensive simulation, uh, telemetry gathering, and like project coordination, the whole thing, the whole space program was a monumental success. And the moon landing have happened, despite some of the other theories. And the formal codification of digital twin concept was done by NASA in early 2020. 2010s, I think 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And in IoT world, especially in industry IoT world, uh, this general concept is um, all over the place. And uh, during this talk, I will try to give you some of my thoughts about that uh, in details. Since like digital tweet conceptually may still be difficult to clarify, I would not go into definition. I will start with analogy. So like biomechanical uh, engineering that allows a single bird to fly is a bit complex. Uh, aerodynamics of feathers, super light bone structure, enormous lungs capacity are vital contribution. Uh, otherwise, those birds would not fly. And there are some which doesn't. A group of birds flying together for long distances migration are working in unison, switching position uh, on the wind to allow them for energy efficient flight as a group. And uh, lastly, a swarm of small birds can act as a basically single organism. And this allows to 
effective way to escape predators, to move as a group, uh, to find a better place, a better spot for uh, making it like the more effective way to um, provide for each of the individuals. And uh, you may ask me, Rafael, but how those things actually relate to digital twin, the evolution concept of it. And uh, yeah, the, see, the, thing, the thing how I'm seeing it is like without this um, groundwork, such as flight capacity, small group interactions and coordinations, none of the more advanced properties would not be possible. And this, uh, mm, swarm behaviors are called emerged properties. And basically this means that uh, the whole group is who are working in unison is actually more than the single individual capacity. And uh, yeah, fortunately for us, software development is much more malleable. And we don't need millions of years of evolution to achieve uh, adaptations. So adding additional capacities uh, for um, IoT or any actually uh, solutions, it's much more easier. So let me start with uh, let me start with disassembling this this pyramid for you. So at the bottom we have monitoring and analyzing. So this reflects to um, devices, uh, for example, for from the industry IoT uh, part of the uh, spectrum that are connected to something. It can be cloud, usually it is. It can be far edge or near edge solution. At that level, just the connectivity, we don't have much of the um, capacity yet. Uh, going up, adding a little bit more effort, we can reach the predicting prescribing layer, which is basically via integration, adding additional layers of, uh, for example, uh, modeling, we can see more, we can uh, analyze the other facets of the model, which are not being um, usually uh, seen on the first glance. And at the top of the pyramid, which is the most effort uh, you need to put in your solutions, are adapting and transforming functionalities. Simulation, this is the pinnacle of digital twin capacity. And just to give you additional context to that also, actually on the Apollo 11, the simulation was there. It was done uh, in completely different way as we are doing it currently in 2022. But without the simulation, without reaching the top of that pyramid, uh, most likely Apollo program would fail, like totally. And um, knowing on which layer is the most value for our clients is the key. Unfortunately, I cannot give you the silver bullet here and just say, yeah, you need to add all of those elements into your solution to be really successful. What I can say is like, you can start really small and add additional capacities to your solution, focusing on behaviors, not on the technology. And um, since I'm already talking about technology, the technology in the dig digital twin spectrum is just a part of the puzzle. As you can uh, imagine, the technologies which are being used for digital twin uh, storage in this case, and this is the vertices that I used for uh, the part of that uh, uh, stream of thought is, yeah, you can have a great time series database and it will be used for storing and querying telemetry effectively. Why? Usually valued value-based time series, it's not super effectively stored on the higher scale on any other database. Those are databases which are being 
perfected to serve that specific purpose, storing large capacity, large amount of time series data. But you cannot store in that kind of database everything. It's not enough. From other perspective, we are usually interested to capture relationships of structures and nodes. Um, this is very, very prominent in industry IoT world when we have multi-layer structure of entities, uh, so-called uh, asset shell modeling. Mm, and the graph database is actually a tool that will allow us to store those relationships effectively on, high, on larger scale and like being able to actually query them effectively also. And same goes for processing patterns such as like events, uh, streams of events. So Lambda Kappa architecture, all of them have their place in digital twin as a part of digital twin. But if you hear that somebody is saying, yeah, event stream processing is digital twin. Um, the graph database is digital twin or time series database is digital twin. Since term is very broad and very generic, it often is partially. And last but not least, uh, recently uh, I'm working more and more with column storage database which uh, on larger scale are unavoidable and for the storage and query of this specific time series uh, subset of information. And combining all of those technologies together gives us the technology landscape of what digital twin is. Fortunately or unfortunately, from the perspective of typical IoT solution, you can have just one of them, all of them, or any other combination. It's always case by case, by case unfortunately. And do we need all of that? The answer, it, it depends. Uh, if we are talking about a small scale, there is no significant difference of storing uh, digital twin data, even in uh, standard RDBMS or like SQL database or document database. On small scale, it really doesn't matter. On larger scale, it does. And uh, in few slides, in, uh, in future, I will be talking about uh, why it matters from the no code and low code. Um, cool. So let me go to a story. This is uh, taken from actually uh, actually one of the pre-sales that I did recently. The client was a company which uh, provides the information about um, the, the specific area network of uh, central UK. They provide the drainage and water information on the water smart water meters and the drainage uh, sensors for their community. And uh, how integrated digital twin, the thing that I was mentioning before, how it actually impacts them. So they do have sensors, lots of them with the capacity for GPS. So they provide information about lay location, if, even if they, you will switch them uh, into a different spot. Uh, the device is sending moderate amount of telemetry. This is over the LoRaWAN protocol and the telemetry stream is very, very uh, narrow. <laughs> and uh, what is missing actually is the network metrics, network capacity. So all of those LoRaWAN gateways uh, in the LoRa, they are being called concentrators. Uh, in LoRa parallel, they are being called concentrators are actually providing coverage for those smart meter devices. And happens to be that those devices are failing a lot. The, I don't mean the leaf devices, the smart meters, they are pretty much stable and pretty dumb. They just send a few telemetry frames per hour and that's it. They are low, uh, low power, like battery powered and uh, there is no much magic there. The gateways, the, the concentrators for LoRaWAN network, that's the other story. Those are a bit old devices based on like 2022 standards. 
and uh, the quality of service for the whole network is very, very poor. So with that in mind, the direction that I go, uh, gone with them uh, is like two different approaches. First, if you are already seeing that your network is not super, uh, super effective, uh, we can do uh, network monitoring and treat your own network as a source of the telemetry because you care about that. This is your own network. You need to have a telemetry to say that we are reaching the SLIs of our own or we are not reaching them. Same goes for uh, the providing additional value for end customers. And this discovery phase is actually the most fun. So during the pre-work for them, I was able to set up the Loravan network server demonstration and provide them also with demonstration uh, stacking of uh, GIS information, GIS information from the network uh, of the Loravan concentrators themselves, stacking with the information about how the pipes are being located in each of the district that this LoRa network was actually located in, and then uh, combine that with analytics on the way how each of the smart meters are being responsible for metering the part of the uh, piping on those maps. And with all of that information, so like integrated digital twin, and uh, now the magic happened. And uh, this company is able to pinpoint the leakage if they will come. Would, this wouldn't be possible if I wouldn't add this additional context of maps to the system itself. And adding this like uh, is the feedback, um, technically speaking, it's not super difficult to integrate from the cloud analytics perspective, but to get those information, that's a different kind of story, which I will not go into this talk. Uh, but the capacity is there. And this is this emerged property, which wasn't anticipated by that particular client. And um, let me tell you another story about connected digital twin. So this is the, this basic level, connected digital twin. Actually, actually, one of the pre sales that I was doing before was about human augmented data enrichment. So there was a, a factory floor and there was lots of machines in it. They have been failing on the various occasion. This is how it rolls. This is how it happened on the production line. And there was no sensor, neither uh, there was a data processing yet. But uh, there was a great idea to utilize existing personnel, the humans on the factory floor, give them the tablets and uh, help them to identify all of the uh, existing issue on the factory floor, just report them. It's very simple, but providing this additional augmentation actually allowed to see uh, optimization for further, like manually by uh, reviewing the data, doing doing analytics over it over this telemetry, we can we actually did pinpoint the places of the particular machine on the particular lines that were more troublesome than another. So here, even though technically speaking, it's not typically like IoT award with the connected digital twin, but the knowledge of people and the capacity of, per, of personnel on that factory floor allowed this to be a solution from the connected digital twin perspective. So yeah, challenge accepted. We can do it even without sensors because people have their senses very well developed. And this is just the first act of that uh, pre-sales, this uh, is already a project actually. So this is the first act, there would be more. Um, and uh, there is still capacity for making it a bit more interesting further. Um, yeah, the, this is what I was talking about. 
Now, uh, since I would need to speed up a little bit, uh, let me move uh, fluently to low code and no code. So low code and no code is getting much more traction last few years. And the idea of so-called citizen developers, which are basically individuals capable of automating their own workflows, innovating over their professional understanding of their business domain, for some of the business owners, it sounds like a dream. And unfortunately, there is not enough uh, substantive discussion on that particular topic. From one hand, I hear happy-go-lucky uh, arguments like limiting upfront investments, uh, more negligible total cost of ownership, and encouraging innovation by citizen developers. All of that is true, though those claims need to be supported by actually verifying that in real life with your own personnel. Uh, same goes from the other side. From the professional side, I'm hearing a concern, a lot of concern actually, on uh, things like lack of proper governance for a citizen developers. Basically, uh, since I'm interacting with lots of the people from cybersecurity, they are saying it's not secure. Uh, it, there is no governance. There is no way to manage them. Uh, the real possibility for so-called shadow IT so people who are uh, trying to make their life easier by incorporating, emulating, or even taking over the standard responsibility for IoT, uh, sorry, for IT um, uh, departments in the organization, and like lack of basis for a scalable solution. All of that is also true without the proper governance, like citizen developers who can hurt themselves and the company very much. Uh, there is a real possibility for shadow IT, and it happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it's happening right now. Uh, same goes for um, the scalability of solution creating some mock with uh, low code, no code, even if it would be fully functional, it's not scalable product out of the box. And this distinction from the business side, yeah, I already have it. It's being created what one of my um, the citizen developers in 20 minutes, yeah, that's true, I can do it in 20 minutes also, but how long it will take to make it scale. And this disharmony uniquely strikes me as a professional, which have a long-term relationships, love and hate, with uh, low-code platforms. So it's true that historically speaking, low-code platforms are ter have terrible reputation, especially from like most prominent reasons are the difficulty for maintenance and vendor locking. And I don't want to point fingers, but I can point it into the few which I work personally, and they are really terrible as a place to be as a part of their ecosystem. From the business perspective, there is also a note that uh, there, is a, there was a relatively small number of citizen developer. The only handful of people who are even interested in doing their own solution or prototyping. There is like, less than 10% at uh, this estimates from Gartner actually. And it's even worse in real life uh, based on the uh, existence of, uh, based on the people that I came across and worked together with. So like nowadays situation is better and better every day, every year, since um, a new workforce is joining uh, with the developer, uh, citizen developer capacity younger people are actually more keen to automate their work, which is great. And uh, how it actually, uh, how it relates to, to, to reality. So um, like from the visual modeling perspective, those tools are great to provide you fast to market results. This is true. Uh, reusability, of the, uh, the solutions, local especially uh, solutions are really great. 
and for small scale, they are uh, pretty decent. And the governance, so policies over how to use the data sources and how the processes can interact with, between each other are more and more pair with the industry standards, especially from the cybersecurity perspective, since this was Achilles tendon of the whole uh, industry. So the most prominent interactions that I recently have, and I can really say that it was great, was visual analytics uh, and uh, visual process definition. Those two areas of low code, no code were actually uh, super smooth to interact with. And I can really uh, talk length about it, uh, but uh, since I have a limited time here, I will focus on the other side of the picture right now. And uh, I see anxiety from developers, like professionals, like high tier professionals, which are saying, yeah, we should be worried about citizen developers taking our job. This is the most ridiculous claim that I ever heard, since it's actually great that citizen developers are having ideas in their head and trying to make the living from these ideas to make their lives easier in work. And by providing separation of concerns, by providing a split to correct layers in IoT uh, driven or IoT augmented low code, no code, we can do it very easily for as easy for them but we should remember that from the scaling and quality perspective uh, low code and no code have a decent quality and some scaling capacities but this is the most brutal truth that if the idea from the citizen developer is good and if uh, he or she is capable of selling this idea as a product, this means that actually our work is needed there to create scalable and um, uh, solution with the decent layer of quality. It depends on the quality attributes defined for it. So if the idea is good, we shouldn't be worried. We should be super happy that somebody actually come, came into that understanding that we can use it like that. And uh, yeah, the, the part which are great, the part which are uh, interesting is this li layered uh, low code, no code. So low code and no code treated as a process definition tool, uh, uh, managing APIs, uh, versions and API contents and end-to-end -end edge computing uh, solution. The first two are already on the market. There are some great tools and uh, we, can, uh, we can go into a bit deeper on each of the tools capacity. And at to end, each computing is still in infancy. There are a few interesting uh, tools that I can recommend. Uh, for example, Litmus Edge, which uh, ha has this capacity to a certain degree, but we are still far from it. So, um, in progress, this is how can I, I can summarize the state of the layered low code, no code for the IoT solutions. Um, for other domains, non IoT domains, the tools are even better suited for their job. So, if you're not doing IoT, I can recommend a few tools uh, which can help your the citizen developers make their life easier. Um, moving to the spectrum, current spectrum. So uh, you may heard about Node Red is quite prominent in um, in the um, edge or device workflows, data enrichment. Uh, from the practicality perspective, this tool is great whenever you would like to start and discuss about the uh, device itself and how the communication on the device layer, like motor speed, acceler acceler accelerate, accelerometer speed, or like motor mode, for example, are uh, connected to the existing device. So this is a useful tool to start discussion about modeling. Do, is this tool the correct tool for managing the high number of devices? Not really. 
but as a tool for initial conversation and uh, going through the innovation phase, this is one of the best tool on the market. You can start using it right now with just Docker container and you don't need much to fake lots of data and start discussion about real the solution about uh, uh, usefulness uh, of this solution for larger scale. And there are other tools uh, which I can also uh, recommend here. In one particular of the slides, this is the App Studio application for so-called micro journeys. I will be referring to that in next slides, so I will not uh, go into much deeper here, but uh, separating of data uh, from the processes and from the communications channel allows to better um, experience for any party included. Um, so let me let me go to the next slide. Uh, so what are the real issues? Which uh, what are the real reasons why some of the vice VCs uh, are interested in low code, no code? First and most important is long time to market. Any solution uh, complex enough would need to take some time to develop. And uh, treating low code and no code as a, a tool to shorten long time to market or speed up development for uh, existing tools, it will not render you the results that you're looking for. The innovation uh, or the con configuration over development, yes, in that areas, you would be covered. But in full-fledged solution, unfortunately, low-code can be just a part of the equation, not the solution uh, as a whole. Uh, lack of the clarity in deliverables, this is quite typical. Uh, same goes with the duct, the duct tape approach for development. If a uh, solution uh, are reaching the duct tape approach layer of quality, there is no significant difference from the quality perspective between such solution, poorly made solution, and uh, low-code and no-code platform. I would even uh, say that low-code, no-code platform, if it's one of those new wave of the solution, new wave of the platform would be actually a bit better. And last but not the least, from the modeling perspective, one model to rule them all. Uh, there is a saying that the, from the data modeling, you are either having a model which is factually correct or the, is useful. You rarely have both at the same time. So if you are using low-code, no-code tool from the IoT perspective as a uh, the starting uh, point, a like kickstart for innovating, this is a great tool. Use it as much as you would like. Uh, for larger solution, which already have been proven as a um, uh, production grade or scale to a higher scale, unfortunately, this will not bring you much joy. Uh, so let me go through the few ideas or the, the, the short um, thoughts that I still have in my mind about the what is digital twin in parallel of the solution architecture currently. I would strike the analogy between master data, the historically speaking, how the master data is being um, described as, so a single source of truth, quality classification and reconciliation and governance. This is all about those three aspects of uh, master data. And the digital twin, at least in my eyes, starts to be more and more like master data. It's distributed. So there is the single source of truth with a small asterisk but the quality starts to be important. The classification modeling starts to be extremely important. Reconciliation, so uh, modeling also starts to be super important. And more and more digital tweet as a concept starts looks like master data from the analytics perspective. If we go to low code, no code, 
those are starting to be new analytics platforms, more heap, but uh, stream analytics, visual analytics, data science, low code and no code starts to be a part, vital part of uh, the analytics inside of the organization. Of course, this is different kind of analytics, not uh, citizen developers versus data science experts are on a bit different layers and a bit different levels. But from the things that uh, those people are doing, they start to be very similar. And how I'm seeing the, uh, I'll try to be a bit futuristic here. So how I'm seeing the future is the split between interactions, which low code and no code platform would be great for. So front end, mobile, AR, VR, even edge, which I know that may be questionable, but I still believe that this is one of most vital interaction with devices, like leave devices uh, that we actually have. Uh, the processes, so robotic operating system, rules engines, if TTT or Node-RED are the great tools for designing processes. And if we already have this layer of presentation or channels of interactions uh, figured out, the processes for processes uh, management tools are the thing. And last but not least with uh, data, information like ERPs, uh, CRMs, marketplaces, cloud, cut, everything in between. This layer will withstand low code, no code for a long time. Uh, but we are seeing that, at least I'm observing from the solution perspective, that more and more people in organization are using Digital Twin as the way to coordinate efforts uh, uh, between the systems. And uh, since the most conceptually striking for me is like more in the system integration rather than IoT world. And uh, I will be looking into that topic even more on the further talks, I, I hope because this is striking for me as something that I didn't anticipate it, that actually digital twin would be used as a way to interact between systems, solutions, um, but why not? Uh, and uh, in the end, like a word of the warning, I hope <laughs> uh, that we'll not end that up, ended up with something like enterprise service bus from uh, the, my younger uh, audience. I hope that you don't know about this abomination from my older audience, which uh, either already see that or already have that on their production. Uh, you know how painful it is to have it and how difficult it is to uh, maintain it. So um, I think we should avoid repeating the same mistakes with low code and no code here, hopefully. Um, yeah, so short summary. I was uh, speaking about evolution of digital twin and how the, each of the segments of the digital twin is important uh, to provide comprehensive solution and how they are touch each other. Uh, so you're building something upon the more uh, and more up to the layer that you would be satisfied with. I was sharing with you some of my experiences on pre-sales and how the integrated digital twin uh, or connected digital twin are actually being used as a tool to discuss with clients uh, or about uh, digitization and Industry 4.0, how those tools are used to have the same language with different clients from different areas. Um, I also discuss about uh, low code, uh, no code, the general terms and how I think that it will be an augmentation for analytics platform to a certain degree. 
And I was also uh, bringing up the topic of a digital twin possibly to be uh, something like master data from the traditional enterprise architecture perspective. Um, plus I added a few uh, information about how the perceived value of low code, no code uh, are related to real needs of low code, no code plus hopefully provided with some of the glimpses of future, how those two things will be uh, used together. And uh, at this point, I would like to say thank you all. And uh, if you have any questions, if you would like to discuss something with me, feel free to reach me at Twitter or Vajeha uh, or any other uh, way, LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook. I'm quite open to have it, even TikTok. I have. I'm quite open to have a discussion with you on those topics. And um, yeah, I hope that it was interesting. And uh, thank you again. Odaegos do studia.